All right. Um, so this is workshop 10, um, which we will be making game book, which is, uh, if you've seen the example tab of web.in slash example, there is a, a game page and you can play what looks to be Agaria with arrow keys. Um, so this is what we'll be making today. It is going to be our last workshop of, of web lab. And yeah, so why don't we get started? So I know, um, personally, I love playing games. I've played a lot of games in my time. Uh, I still continue to play a lot of games. Um, so, you know, all sorts of things from like Minecraft, Among Us, uh, League of Legends, Fortnite, Valorant. But yeah, there's a lot of things on here. Um, some of you might have played some or all of these games. Um, and they might all seem very different, but it turns out that most of these games actually have a lot of like very similar um, components. And so we'll be kind of introducing how to think about or how to go about designing games and how to think about um, actually building them. So uh, one of the main things that sort of differentiates uh, games, that, especially real-time games that involve people playing together um, with the stuff that we've been building the last nine workshops or last 10 workshops um, is one, complicated game logic and game state. So what that means is, for example, if you think of a game like Among Us, for those of you who have never played, um, it involves like you running around and doing tasks and one of other people in the lobby is secretly a killer that is killing other people um, and your goal is to find out who that person is and vote them out. Um, but in this case, you might have to think about a lot of information, like where everyone is in the game, you know, what all the tasks are, uh, if people are, you know, what the progress of the tasks are, like maybe who's doing what task at what time. Um, you have to think about, you know, people trying to kill each other, like that interaction. You might think about being able to report, you know, when someone, ha when you see a dead body, you might think about the voting system, and there's sort of a lot of moving parts that all kind of come together and make the game work. But there's a lot of sort of complicated logic behind all of this, and we'll kind of get into how to actually make that happen. Another thing is in games, there's usually a much higher need for good graphics, um, specifically because there's a lot of stuff happening. And if you don't, and you can't see what's going on, you can't really play the game. For something like Catbook, it's very simple. You know, we just have components displayed. You know, they don't really update that much. You just have like mostly just text. But for example, if you were to actually play a game, um, you'd want to be able to see, you know, what's going on, like where am I, where are other people, etc. So these are some of the main challenges that make games um, significantly different than a lot of the stuff we've been building so far. So I guess quick over a cap or overview of like what um, the kind of structure of Catbook that we've done so far. We have our user, which is the clock, which is on the client. Client sends some requests to the backend server. There also, there's also sockets that we mentioned yesterday. We have our database, which is going to store a bunch of information. Um, for our purposes, that's going to be MongoDB. We have our auth, with, which we use Google for. And then this is kind of the main picture of like how Catbook is set up with the sort of different machines and the different things that, the different like big components that we we're kind of working with. Um, game logic and game state, so kind of all of the actual information, the data of the game is actually going to live mostly on the back end. Um, sometimes you can choose to store some things on the server, um, but for the art purposes, Pretty much everything is just going to be on the back end. And then we'll use this really cool piece of technology called HTML Canvas on the front end, um, on the client, to actually render and display the kinds of stuff that we want to show to the user. So what is HTML Canvas? Um, it turns out Canvas is a built-in feature to HTML, like it's modern versions of HTML that you use. So you don't need to use any sort of external libraries. Um, and what it kind of is, is it's, it's literally a canvas as a blank rectangle and you can draw whatever you want on that canvas. Uh, in this case, we have like an example of a canvas with like an animation of a ball bouncing on the ground. And it turns out that canvas itself doesn't technically have any like animation features. Um, it's just, you just draw things. But because canvas can render images very, very quickly, um, hundreds of times per second, when you kind of move the drawing that you're trying to draw, or that you're trying to render a little bit at every frame, that just becomes an animation. So in this case, this ball looks like it's moving, but it's actually just a bunch of pictures drawn in very quick succession. And so we basically, and most, I mean, performance, basically all performance uh, graphics use the kind of same concept. You just draw the same picture over and over again, like really, really fast, and you kind of change it a little bit in between, and it looks like things are moving. So um, that's kind of how Canvas works. 
One very important detail to remember when working with Canvas or any other kind of display um, libraries or any kind of like display in general, um, it's usually convention for the origin to be in the top left corner of the screen or the top left corner of whatever thing that you're working with. Um, the X axis is normal, it goes from left to right as you increase, um, but the Y axis is inverted. So increasing the Y value um, goes down like on the screen. So today we'll be building basically Agario, but uh, with arrow keys and a little bit more scuffed, but it's kind of, I mean, it's like a one and a half hour workshop. If they made Agario in one and a half hours, I'd be pretty impressed. Um, if you visit weblab.is slash example, you can see something like this. Um, you spawn in as like a cell. There is these little like, what you can see, there's these tiny little food pellets that also spawn randomly across the screen. You can move around, eat those food pellets and grow larger. Um, you can also have other players in the game at the same time, and they can move around as well. Um, you can eat other players and like you know, absorb their mass, absorb their size. Um, yeah, this is kind of just a little animation of what we might be playing or might be making today. Yeah. So any questions so far? All right, if anything comes up, feel free to ask on the questions doc or put yourself on the help queue. Um, but I'll be moving on. So how do we actually go about designing a web game? So we have this massive component tree, um, the React component tree that we've made for Catbook. Um, it turns out that when we make games, you don't really need that much more. So in this case, we will have one new component for the entire workshop, and that is going to be the game page. It's just a new page, just like we made before, um, and it will contain all of the stuff that we'll be doing today. Um, it turns out for games, most of the logic, I mean, basically all the logic is happening on the server side. So at least for a client, you don't really have to do that much for the game itself, other than the actual like rendering. And it turns out this like canvas thing is not actually like, part of React. I will show you how to like connect them um, later in the workshop, um, but it's not going to be its own component. So to recap some context of like the kind of files that we've been working with um, in, work in the previous workshops, we have a bunch of components in React land. We have our client socket that we set up yesterday. We have login, um, stuff with Google. And on the server side, we have our server socket. We also have a couple other things like API endpoints that we haven't really drawn here. We're going to add a game component in React land. We're going to add an input file that'll let us process inputs. For example, if you're moving your mouse or pressing buttons on the keyboard, we're going to add this thing called Canvas Manager, and that would be um, something that like controls what is on the screen. So just essentially it draws what you see. We'll add some game logic for the server. And, and so when you press an input on the client side, you, know, you click a button on your keyboard, that sends it through a socket to the server, and then the server will then process that information in this game logic, and then send a response back to you. And so that'll go back to the socket, to your client socket, which will load your game component, and then finally to your canvas manager, which will draw it on the screen. So this diagram is a pretty messy, so you know, kind of like make it look a little nicer. So this is a sort of more complete structure of gamebook of all the stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, it turns out for our purposes, the login, other components, and the other server files will not really be used. So we're just going to pretend they don't exist for now and get rid of them. So this is all the stuff that we'll be touching um, for this workshop. So when the user makes an input, like they press the button on the keyboard, um, that'll go through a client socket, which will then use that socket.emit that we talked about yesterday to send information to the server. The server will then use the information, do some stuff, and then send a response back. And that will go through the same the server socket, back to the client socket, and then to the game component, which will render it on the page. Now, this actual thing that we're sending back, um, it's a bunch of data. You might think like what kind of data we might want to send back. And this is something we call the game state. So what kind of stuff do we keep in the game state? You want to know like who's playing the game, so we know like you know, who to send it to, right? You want to know the location of all the players in the game. So like in our case, Agario, like there's just cells moving around. So we want to know like where you are. Um, we want the color of each player um, because you know we want to be able to see different players having different colors, so you can know like which one's you. Maybe how big each player is. Maybe where the food is, and maybe if someone's like won the game or something. So we package all this information into like one 
big object, but I call it the game state. So game state lives on, or in the game logic file, it's on the server. The server will do whatever computations it needs with the game state and send that information to the client. Um, wait, one thing to remember is that because the client can technically do whatever it wants, it can like try to hack the system or whatever, um, we can't actually trust the client to like know what it's doing. So the true correct version of the game state is always on the server. So if the client tries to do something, maybe they like disconnect halfway through, that information will not get sent through. Like the only actual like correct information is always on the server. All right. So in the past, I mentioned that there's or we covered two main ways of communicating between client and server. Um, we have sockets, which we talked about in workshop nine, and that is a sort of way to communicate um, quickly and very rapidly. You can have a lot of live updates. It's useful for just seeing information as you know as it comes in. And then we also have API requests or HTTP requests, um, and that's going to be much slower but a lot more reliable. Um, you won't miss usually you won't miss an HTTP request at all. Um, and it's usually used for like just initializing things or sending large uh, amounts of data. And we'll be using both of these um, in this workshop. And one last thing before we start, um, there's a very useful JavaScript function called for each. Um, what it does is it takes an array, and then you just some array, dot for each, you pass it a callback function that takes an element and does something with it. Um, it's very similar to map, which we use in Catbook. But it actually, you can use it to change, the, to mutate the array itself. You can also do things with the elements that don't involve mutating the array or like changing anything. Um, I'll show you a quick example. You have a, like an array of numbers like this. You can use for each, then print out like two times whatever that number is, and just prints out two times the number. Um, the array is unchanged. You can also use like, for example, my numbers dot pop. By the way, the pop function just removes the last element. So in this case, it'll give you the first half of the array. It might be a little funny to see like why this actually happens like this, but um, essentially it looks at like each element and then it does whatever is in the function. Um, it's very useful because you won't get any sort of undefined or out of bounds errors. Um, but So we'll be using this uh, in this workshop. All right, so let's get started. Um, right before, or before we actually like, you know, check out to the branch, I want to mention that this workshop will feel very different from some of the previous workshops. And that is because in Catbook, we've kind of been doing it as a method to teach like each new thing one at a time. But for this purpose, or for, or for Gamebook, we have chosen to do something that's more intuitive. So if you are actually working on a project and kind of developing feature by feature, uh, we'll be kind of following that process and thinking like, oh, we want to be able to do this now and then fully implement that feature and then move on and fully implement the next feature and so on. And so this is much more similar to what you will actually be doing in your own projects. Um, in terms of the like the process that we're kind of going through. Um, it will also have a lot of code. It will not make you code all of it. Like, we'll walk you through a lot of stuff. Um, but if you have any questions at any point, ask on the questions doc or uh, put yourself on the help queue. So with that being said, you can run git fetch. Uh, make sure you run git fetch because there may have been things updated since you last uh, fetched the code. Run git reset dash dash hard and git checkout w10 dash starter. Cool. All right. Did anyone run the commands? Cool. All right. All right. So the first step we're going to make is just making the front end page. So remember that Nick said all of our game is going to lie in one page on our um, on our front end. Which is a game page, right? So we call how we have a profile or our feed or you know other pages in the website. Well, games all get reside in one front page. So what we need to do is to make this page. Uh, and make it's going to check out the which is this size still readable for everyone, by the way? I'm like unable to see. If it's not readable, just Put it in the question stock and then we will be success. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, like I said, previously we made a book and we had several pages, right? We had a home page, we had a chat page. Well now we want a game page. Play our game. Sorry, go on. <laughs> so 
our first step is making a blank game page. You guys have made a bunch of pages, so it's now it's your turn to um, try to make this game page by yourself. So you guys should start with the subset 1.1. Um, use the search feature in VS Code to find any to dos in, um, in the code base, and then first step is to route to the game page in app.js. So we'll give you like one or two minutes to do that. It's in app.js, lines 8 and 61. All right, so let's implement the routing to the game page in app.js. Walk it here. So at the top, we have to import our game component from our game file. So import game from pages game.js. And further down, what we're going to do is add the route to the games page. And in this case, we're just going to have games page be slash game. And in this case, we want to pass in our user ID because we only want people to be able to play a game if they are logged in. And uh, we want to be able to track the winner and you know other things to do with um, the user itself. So we should pass in the user ID to this page. All right. Now moving on to the next subset, 1.2. We're going to go back to the slide. Um, now we're going to add the game page link in that bar. So we have the route, right? Now if we run our website, we can go to slash game, and you can you know, go to the game page, the blank game page, but we don't have a way to have the user know that the game page exists, so let's add it to the navbar. And that will be in navbar.js um, around, around line 29. So we'll give you like a minute to do that. All right, let's, uh, let's start together. Hopefully that wasn't too complicated. Hopefully you just realized that you can just copy and paste the three lines of code right above. Um, so we're just going to link to slash game. 
right? So all we need to do is change the network work to slash game and then or change the name to game. And now if we run our server and then our client npm start and npm run hot loader and go to the capital website, now we'll be able to click the game page and it's really just playing. Except uh, we have we have implemented a few things for you, um, just like a login modal. Just make sure you log in first before we go. All right. Any questions before we move on? Cool. So please run give me set hard dash hard and then get check out w10 step one. So we're going to pick up the pace of it and okay, run some part and check out the step one. Yeah, so like I said, we're going to pick up the pace of it and this step is going to be a little chunky. We're going to do um, basic game logic in our display. So in this step, we're, our goal is to define a game state that our game is going to hold. And we're going to be able to start the game and spawn in player. Um, and these are just sort of like fundamental things that our game needs to implement. And we're also going to see how to use a canvas. Right? Canvas, as before, is what the client sees. It's what is rendered to the client. So before we get into the steps, there is a clear division between client and server in something like the game. right? So on our game page, what we're going to want to see at the end of the step is a black canvas, or we fill it with a black background. So the client will see a black canvas, and as soon as a client, the as soon as the client connects to the website, they're they're going to spawn into the into the game. And uh, for now, we're just going to add add the player as soon as they um, as soon as they log into the website. And in the server side, what you don't see is we're gonna we're gonna hold a game state. Um, this is a game state object, and the current information we're gonna hold is winner and players. And we're gonna constantly update that game state, you know, as we as the game goes on, and we're gonna periodically send updates to the client. And how we're gonna do that is through the server socket file. And finally, we're gonna define a function to spawn a player when the client socket connects. And this is all going to happen in the service socket file. And you know, you might be thinking, well, we don't want everyone to spawn into the game as soon as they log into the page. Well, we're going to fix that a bit later in step six. But for now, to make it simple, we're just going to spawn in a player as soon as they uh, log in to capital. So one quick note before we get in, you might be wondering, you know, we have this canvas element in our in our HTML, right? Remember, everything on the client is just HTML. So canvas itself is an element. It's just a tag canvas. But if we render the canvas element in our HTML page, how do we update that at the same time as rendering it on the page? Well, there's this thing called document.getElementById. And it's like sort of a you know outdated version of trying to um, update things on the HTML on what on what you're trying to render. But when you're using React, you want to use something called use React. It's a special hook that you know you can't really you know update the state. Um, it is considered state though. Um, canvas ref is you know the ref is something called a reference. You can think of it kind of like a badge. So we declare our reference canvas ref by doing const canvas ref equals to use ref, and in, um, we're just going to use the value null to initialize it. Um, it doesn't really matter. And we're going to pass this canvas ref reference to two different places. We're going to pass it to what we're going to render on the page, so the canvas HTML tag. Um, canvas has a special tag um, input called ref, and we can just pass in canvas ref to that. And we're also going to pass this canvas ref reference to a function called draw canvas, which we're going to define later. And basically, what this is going to do is now these two places have the same reference to you know, the same element. So we're going to be able to render that element and also update it at the same time. 
So let's break down step two before we get into it. So, you know, just a quick overview. We have this on the right side. We have this um, diagram of how the server is going to communicate with the client. So, you know, what we've been doing with sockets is sort of like server client communication, right? So for now, we're going to start with sockets. And we're not going to, you know, send anything from the client to the server in step two. Right now, we're just having the server send stuff to the client. So what, we're, what are we going to want to do on the server and do on the client? So we're going to want to start the game, right? start running game. And we're also going to want to periodically update the game. And this is called the game loop. Right? That's all on the server side. Remember, all of the game logic lives on the server side. And after we update the game state periodically, we're going to want to send that game state to the client also. So we're going to use sockets to do that. Another thing we're going to do in step two is spawn player, um, remove player. Those are just some utility functions. And also we're going to, on the client side, when we receive an update, we want to process it. And then when we get player data from the game, uh, from the server side, we want to be able to draw it on the canvas to render whatever the game is. Whatever is happening in the game. So let's start with you know these stuff. So how about we initialize the game state, start game state, or start the game on the server and send game updates to the client. Um, these are three things that we need to do. It's you know it seems like a lot, but remember Nick mentioned that we're doing primarily feature development in this workshop, so it's going to touch multiple files. So we're going to show you guys how to do this um, instead of you having to implement it because we know it's a lot of work. Um, so let's start by going to the game logic file. Bro. That's so cool. Yeah, so the first thing we want to do is define our game state. So right now, let's hold the winner and players in our game state. And then later in the file, later in the file, we want to define a function to update the game state periodically. And this is just a filler. All right, we're just going to fill it with a comment. We're not going to really do anything with it right now. But later, we're going to um, define some stuff to do. And um, just consider this update game state function as your game loop, right? So if we run this function, we're going to run everything in the game loop, and we're going to run it again and again. Yeah, I run everything. All right, now that we have that done, um, we can go to still set as we come on. Um, this is part three. Okay. Yeah, so within the game logic file, we also want to export um, some of the functions that we've defined. So we can export the game state and export update game state. And this is so that we can use it in other files. All right. And we have a couple of things, a couple more things to do in step 2.1. So we have our game state in game logic now, and we have a way to update our game periodically. But how do we actually send those to the client? We have to use server side. So let's uncomment um, the top code in server socket and send game state. What it's going to do is basically use the syntax we've been, we've been using with sockets, io.init, basically just send an update to all the clients um, with the game state. And later, we can uncomment the next few lines. And this sort of look, looks complicated. We did mention it briefly in the JavaScript uh, JavaScript workshop. But basically, the set interval function is sending updates to the client at 60 frames per second, or you know, 60 ticks per second. Um, you know, a thousand means a thousand milliseconds, and we're doing that 60 times per second. And then finally, we're going to uncomment this one line, start running game. We're just going to start running the game as soon as our server starts up. 
So that was a lot of work in one sub-step, but essentially what we did was define a game state and then send updates to the client with that game state. Right, let's move on to step 2.2. So now we're just going to define a few utility functions. Let's define spawn player in um, gamelogic.js. So if you go to gamelogic.js and you can find the to do on the, on the uh, file 2.2. Uh, we're going to give you a few minutes to try to implement this function by yourself. Just spawn in a player. Um, the comments should be very explanatory. Um, if you have any questions, please go in the help queue or add your questions to the question back. Pretty or just leaving me a space. That's so sad. Yeah. Not holding up. Okay. Not holding up. Start importing some things. Okay, so let's, we're going to start implementing um, spawn query function. So we can start typing. So we're going to want to add, sort of add the player to our player's um, object. So we can do, we can basically just, you know, add a key, which is our ID, to the players. Um, so we're going to, sort of like a Python dictionary syntax, uh, we can do namescape.players and brackets of ID and then assign it to an object. And this object is going to hold whatever information we want for the player. So we have a position and we have a radius, which we define to be a constant. Um, and then finally we want the color of the player. And this is just, you can hard code in whatever color you want, but this is just fun syntax to sort of get a random color in a colors array that we define at the top of the file. Um, not necessary, but just to spice up our game a bit. Cool. So, any questions before we move on? I like colors. Again, it's fine if you don't get, you know, even half of this workshop. You know, we have very advanced content in this lecture. 
It's basically just everything you learned through W9 except compressed. So feel free to go back into um, the video and review things you've done. You can also use some of our code in your own um, project because you know if you want to make a game, just use our code as an example. Cool. So let's move on to step two point three. So similar um, in Spawning a player, let's just define a function to remove a player. It's in the same file, it's just a bit more down. Not exactly line 51, but um, just search for the function name delete player or remove player. And we're just going to give you around 30 seconds to do this. It's a bit short, but it's just one line. All right, so let's do one this one line of code. So you can use this keyword called delete, and basically delete, given a reference to an object or you know, an object itself, is just gonna delete it. So let's just do delete, game state now players, and of the ID of the player that we wanna delete. All right, let's move on to step um, 2.4. So now we've done all that we want to do in game logic, right? We've defined our game state, we've defined a function to spawn in a player and remove a player, but how do we send that information over to the client? Well, let's work on server side. So in this step, we're going to want to call a spawn player when a user connects to the website, or when a user logs into the website. And so let's go to line 34 in service socket.js. We're going to give you a few minutes to do this also. Um, just follow the instructions. Um, basically, you're just going to implement one line of code to um, call spawn player when the user joins. When the user logs into the website. So let's, I said a few minutes, but it was just one line of code. So let's um, draw your attention to this line of code. So if you scroll up to the top, you can see that we sort of define an import from the game logic cloud. Require is just a special syntax for you know, importing a module. And we have like several syntaxes to import stuff. Um, if we do require, we can basically assign everything from that module, everything we export from that module to a variable. And this variable is a constant called game logic. So any functions that we export from the game logic file, we can just call by using game logic dot that function. Um, or even an object or anything else. So let's do game logic dot spawn player and um, user um, user. 
right, let's move on to step 2.5. So now we can spawn in players, but let's actually, um, let's actually process updates in the client when the client gets an update. Um, so we're going to switch over gears to the client. Um, we've actually predefined code for you guys um, that like emits updates from the server to the client, and as you can recall, we did that earlier. Um, so now the client has updates, game updates, right? And let's define a function in game.js to process updates from the server. So navigate to game.js and find the 2.5 on that page. And this one, we're just going to uncomment stuff and explain it. So in the first part of 2.5, we've, de we've defined this process update function for you guys. And basically, all this process update function is going to do is take in an update from the server and send it to our can draw canvas hover function, which is going to draw stuff in our canvas. Pretty self-explanatory. And we import this draw canvas function from our canvas manager, which we're going to touch in a second. And part two of this step, we're going to define stuff in our use effect, use effect. And we call that use effect will run whenever anything in the dependency array changes. And in this case, since we have an empty dependency array, right, we're just going to run this as soon as the user connects to the page. So what do we want to see when the user connects to the page? Well, when the user connects to the game page, we're going to want to turn on the socket to receive any updates from the server. So we're going to do socket.on, and we're going to call this, we're going to call this um, emission update. You can call it whatever you want, but we're just going to call it update in this case. And the socket is going to listen for anything called update and take that update and send it to the process update function. All right, so once you've uncommented that code, let's switch gears to Canvas Manager and set to code 6. So now we have a way to get updates from the server into the client, and we have a way to send it to this draw canvas function, this mysterious draw canvas function. So let's actually look at this draw canvas function in Canvas Manager. All right. So we're going to have you guys do a bit in this file um, if you have Canvas Manager open. So if you go to um, the top part of the file, you can see that there's 2.6. We're going to have you fill in one line to um, draw a player as a circle. So we've defined a function fill circle right above. Just call that function in this draw player function to draw the player at the desired location. You have we're not going to send this to this. So we can call the function fill circle. We're going to feed it something called the context. And then we're going to feed it the draw x, draw y, which are, are converted coordinates, and then the radius and the color that we pass it. And I want to take a moment to explain what exactly this context is. So if you can scroll down to the draw canvas function, you can see that we're defining something called the context using this method that Canvas provides, which is canvas.getContext. And basically what context is, is just a way to fill a canvas. Every time 
we want to draw something on our canvas, we need to discover the new context. Or we can use an existing context. But basically, context, in this case, we're using a 2D context, which is just drawing things 2D. Um, we just need to get the context from the canvas element in order to draw things on it. So walking through the draw canvas function, it's not too important to understand what this does, because you can just simply copy and paste this code into your own code. Um, basically, we're just going to fill um, the canvas as black, and then we're going to um, define the dimensions of the canvas. And then now we're just going to show you guys how to um, draw all the players in the canvas. And because of time, let's actually just implement this um, for you guys. So remember that this for each function is basically a map function that JavaScript has, except it doesn't, or except that it does mutate the array. So in this case, our draw state players array, we want this player, we want or for each of these players, we want to do something, right? So let's draw the player. Um, you calling the draw player function. And again, we can just pass in the context, um, the, posi the x position, the y position, radius, and color. And I mean, you might be wondering why we do object of values. Like, it's kind of weird, right? But basically, object is a type in, in JavaScript. And if you listen to the text lecture, it's sort of like a higher order type. It's not a primitive type. But object has its own methods. And one of these methods is dot values. And you can just get the values of this um, of draw state dot players, um, which are which gives us the uh, player objects that we defined earlier in game object. And we can do stuff to each of those player objects. Okay, any questions before we move on? That was quite a lot. So you can also throw them in the question stuff. All right, so now we're done with step two. And we can sort of demo uh, the website to show you guys what exactly we've done. So now we have this blank canvas on our website. And when we log in using Google Auth, as desired, our player is just going to spawn in. And right now we just have the player spawning in at a random location on the canvas. This is a good start, but we can't even move, right? Like, how do we play the game? We can't move. We just see things on the screen without any live update. So let's move on to step three. So before we move on to step three, please run dmdset-hard and then check out w10-step2. All right, so now let's add moving to our game. And the way we're going to play Agario, in this case, is through the keyboard. Um, we're just going to use the arrow keys as inputs. So a quick demo of what we want to actually implement in this step. So we're going to be able to move using the arrow keys. So let's break down the step as we did with step two. So we have the same picture as step two on the right. And in this case, the bolded, uh, the bolded words or the bolded functions are what we're, we're going to want to implement in this step. So the reason we couldn't move before is because we had no way for the client to send updates to the server. What if the client you know, wanted to move, but like, they couldn't send updates to the server, so you couldn't do anything about it. 
So what we're going to do is define a move function um, using client socket to send um, updates from the client to the server using the client socket. And then in step 3.3, we're going to add event listeners to our client. And you might recall that event listeners basically listen for any inputs that the user has. In this case, we're going to listen for key, key down presses and, um, and just reflect that change in the client. And just one quick note that event listeners are different from sockets. Right? Event listeners only exist in the client, and they listen for inputs from the client. What we can do is we can send information that the event listener listens for through the socket to the server after that. But event listeners only exist in the client, and we can't you know, send data directly from the event listener inputs to the server. And so that's the reason why we need to find a separate move function using the client socket. And finally, we're going to define a move player function in the server side um, to basically listen for the inputs and then move the player accordingly. So let's start with step 3.1. Let's send the move data to the server um, from the client uh, using the client socket. So navigate to clientsocket.js and go to line 10. Okay, is everyone there? Give a thumbs up or anything. Awesome. Okay, so let's start by uncommenting these few lines of code. So basically, we're just enabling our socket on the client side to send updates to the server. And we're just going to call this update move. Um, so the server is going to listen for any updates called move. And this move function is going to take in a direction and send that direction to the server. All right, now let's move on to the next part of step 3.1, in input.js. So we're going to ask you to implement a few things in this input.js file. So first, you should uncomment the top line import move. Uh, we're going to want to be able to directly call the move method to send things to our server. And in this help handle input function, we're going to listen for or our event. We're going to take the event, or we're going to take the. Um, we're going to listen for events from our event listener. And if they match those events, we're going to send them to the server. Or we're going to send that to our client socket. So you can sort of copy and paste the first three lines of code in this function. And we're going to ask you to um, implement it for the arrow down um, left and right. So let's give you around one to two minutes to do this. Just feel free to copy and paste some code. Sorry. 
All right. So hopefully you got a chance to implement at least one of the other directions. So we're going to listen for also arrow down, arrow right, and arrow left. And we're just going to call the move function for each of those cases. And one thing I want to note is it seems kind of weird that we're just, we just know what string to put in, right? The reason why we're going to listen for arrow up, arrow down, arrow right, and arrow left is because that's what the um, MDN docs tell us to do, basically. Um, event listeners use those keywords for um, pressing down keys. And you can, on your own, when you're actually making your game, you can look at the docs and see what string that they're um, expecting. And another thing that makes you magical is that we're just calling loop with up, down, right, left. And this is something, of, this is like a personal choice that you can do. Um, in our case, yeah, we can put whatever we want. Um, later on in our server side, when we listen for an update from our client socket, we're going to listen for exactly these strings. So we just need to keep that in mind when we're actually implementing um, the strings that we want to, string updates that we want to set. So I hope that clarified a bit with the strings. Okay, so let's move on. Don't worry if you got a little stuck. Um, you can always do get reset hard and um, check out the next step later on. So let's actually be able to handle handle keyboard inputs in input.js. Um, so let's go back to input.js file. Oh, we just did that. All right. So now that we finished that, um, now we have a way to send our keyboard our keyboard inputs through the client socket to the server. But let's find a way to send keyboard inputs, keyboard presses to the client socket. And this is going to be in step two point three or three point three. And here we're going to add an event listener to the game page and remove the event listener when the client disconnects. So let's navigate to the game.js file. And we're going to give you around one to two minutes again to implement these two lines of code. One line of code goes in as soon as you use the use effect hook. And the other line goes in into the return statement. And you can read the description in the file. I'll also explain after you implement it. Um, but basically, we're going to add the event listener on mounting the component and remove the event listener on unmounting the component. All right, so I was told that we are short on time, so we're going to implement these for you guys. Um, so just look up and follow along. So in this case, there's a special syntax to define an event listener. And window is actually a global variable that is defined when we start up our website. So um, window .add event listener basically just as an event listener for the client. Um, so whenever the client presses down a key, it's going to call the handle input callback function. And on this return statement, like I mentioned before, the return is going to run on unmounting the component, which means when the user leaves a page, we're going to remove the event listener from actually listening to events. And this helps us clean up a bit um, because when the user leaves a page, we don't want the user inputs to keep you know, messing with the game. We want the user to be able to stop playing the game when they leave the game page. So two important functions are window.add event listener and window.remove event listener. And finally, the last thing we're going to do in this step is we're going to define a function to move a player on the canvas given input directions. And this Function is going to be called move player in gamelogic.js. So if you guys could go to gamelogic.js and navigate to uh, line 47, 
We'll also implement this one for you guys because we're running short on time. Essentially, what we're going to want to do is we're going to have the player ID, and we're going to also be inputted the player direction. And for each of these cases, remember the string that we defined is up, down, left, and right. For each of these cases, we're going to move the player on the actual or move the player um, in the actual game state. So Nick is implementing the different ways that a player can move. Um, again, we have four cases, up, down, left, and right. And we called in the canvas, x goes from left to right. And the negative x direction is to the left, uh, this, this way. And the positive x direction is to the right. And for the y, the negative y direction is actually up. And the positive y direction is down. And this time we're just going to hard code in 10 to move. You can hard code in whatever value you want. Um, determines the speed of the player's answer. One thing to note here is that um, you mentioned that for the canvas, y goes, uh, or y increases as you go down, but here the up direction says y increases. Um, that's actually, so you, like, this is on the back end, so you don't actually have to keep the same convention on canvas. I think simply because it makes more like logical sense to most of us that the up direction is increasing y. I've chosen to keep the up direction as increasing y. Um, and, you, and you can do this, and you can do the same on the server um, or on your own. Uh, but we actually convert the coordinates on the canvas itself before we display anything. So if you're on Canvas Manager, there's actually this convert coordinates thing. And you'll notice that draw y subtracts the y value from the canvas height. And that's actually why it gets converted. Yeah, so a bit more, oh, a bit more, a bit more overhead um, to make our y direction the way we want it to. But just know that on the actual canvas, um, the y values are sort of unintuitive. All right, so now that we defined this uh, move player sort of like logic, let's see what we actually can do in our game. So now if we want to press the arrow up, down, left, and right, we can actually move the player. And it's pretty good, right? Now we can actually receive updates on the client, and that's what's you know, updating our server, or updating our canvas 60 frames per second, and we're just going to be able to move. And one thing to note is we don't actually down the player. Um, the player can like, literally go off the screen. Um, this might be some optimization you can do later on, but for the purpose of this lecture, you're not going to. All right, so can everyone run get a set dash dash hard and get check out the 10 dash step three to get caught up? Okay, let's move on to eating food. You know, you guys just had lunch, but hopefully you're not too hungry now. Um, okay. So this is a quick demo of what we want to do for this step. We basically just want to spawn in foods. Um, the unit of food that we use in our game is mainly called food. Um, and we use foods to you know multiple foods. And then we want the player to move around and be able to eat these foods and grow in size. So let's quickly break down this step. So we have the same diagram as we had before. Um, sort of like the input feeding into the client socket, um, interfacing with the main page, and the canvas manager on the client side. On the server side, we have our game logic file, which holds the game state, 
and the game loop and all our game logic basically um, interfacing with the service socket and um, we haven't touched this but API endpoints. So what we want to do with this step is first we want to be able to um, up, we want to add some things to our game state. So what we're going to add is food data, essentially just a array of foods in our game. Uh, we're going to want to add the capability to spawn food into our game. And on the client side, we're going to want to be able to draw food on our canvas given the updates from the server. And we have a lot of this in place already, right? Our game state already has, is, is being sent to the client. In 4.2, we're going to want to compute um, all the possible ways that players can eat foods, um, every server team, and this is basically just going to make sure that if players on top of the food, the player will eat it. 4.3, we're going to want to implement a function to remove food from the game, and 4.4, we're going to check if there's enough food in the game, and we're going to update the game state accordingly. So we're going to demo through a lot of this for you guys. Again, if you're stuck or you don't understand something, please come back to the lecture video. Um, that being said, let's move on to step 4.1. So in 4.1, we're going to do three things. We're going to add food to the game state. Right? Food is just an array in our game state. We're going to define a function to spawn food. And we're going to draw these foods on the canvas in the client side. So let's first go to the game state. Let's just define food, assign food to an empty array, and we initialize our game state. And now later in the file, let's define a function called spawn food. And walking through the code, all we're going to do is we're going to add a food object to our food array whenever we want to spawn in a food. So in JavaScript, the method to add something to an array is called push. So it adds it to the end of the array. So in this case, because food is an array, we're going to push an object that holds the food's position, which initialized to a random position, the food size, which is predefined, and then the color of the food, which again is just a random, a random color. And then the last thing we wanted to do in step 4.1 was to go over to the canvas manager and draw foods on our canvas given updates from the server. And in this case, remember we already have access to the game state. So that's referred to by the draw state. So we can simply just do draw state dot food and use a for each to draw each of these foods onto our canvas. Very similar to the players. Moving on, let's do step 4.2. So, in this step, we're going to define a function to check if any players can eat any foods. And this is going to be in the game logic file. It's sort of clunky, right? You know, every we're sending updates every 60 seconds. Every 60, we're sending updates 60 times every second. So. We're going to run this a lot. And what we want to do is actually just compare players and foods pairwise. And this seems very like algorithmically bad, right? We essentially have like a double for loop, but it's fast enough for our case, our purpose to just do that. So essentially what this code is doing is we're going to iterate over the players, um, players array in this case, and Iterate over the foods array and use a helper function called player attempt to eat food to check if a player can eat the food, if it's big enough to eat the food, or if it's in range to eat the food. Any questions about that? That was sort of um, complicated to understand. So, any questions? Okay, so let's move on to step 4.3. So in step 4.3, we're going to define a call function to actually remove the function, or sorry, remove the food in the game logic. 
So let's navigate to gamelogic.js and line 127. So here, let's define a function to remove food. This is actually one of the more complicated functions that you guys are going to see today, um, even though it should be relatively simple, like in theory. Um, essentially, what we're doing is actually getting the index of the food um, given the reference to the food. And the reference to the food in this case is f. This is a variable f. Um, so once you get the index of the food in the food array, we essentially um, check to see if this index exists, right? If the food exists in the array. And if the index is in the array, if it's not negative one, then we splice the array of food. Um, and this essentially just gets rid of that um, one element in the array, here, like where that index is. Um, negative one is just what JavaScript chooses to return if the reference to that object doesn't exist in the array. Right? Um, and you can read all these on docs online. Okay, so now let's scroll up and implement um, the part two of step four point three, which is just calling remove food in our helper function whenever we want to, um, whenever the conditions to remove food are met. And the conditions in this case are that the player is within range to eat the food and that the player is big enough to eat the food. And you can see this in the two if statements um, right next to the remove food. All right, let's move on to step 4.4. We're gonna do two things in this step for you guys. Uh, we're gonna define a function to check if there are enough foods in the game. And also we're gonna add food functions to the game. So further down in gamelogic.js. So let's uncomment this function, check enough foods. It essentially just checks if there are less than 10 foods on the game. And then spawns food if there, if there are less. And then in the update game state function, we can call um, the compute players eat foods, which is our function to check pairwise if a player can eat food and check to see if there are enough foods on in our game and spawn in food if we um, if we don't have enough. And remember this update game state function is running 60 ticks per second. So it's going to be very fast and we're going to essentially get very, very instant updates to our game. Okay, so now we're done with step four and let's demo um, what we've done. So now when we move around, we can actually eat food and the food is removed from the game when we go over it and we're big enough to eat it and we actually grow in size also. This is almost like normal Daria. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, but to get caught up, please run get reset dash dash hard and get check out w10 dash step four. So can I get a thumbs up if people are caught up? Cool. So as I mentioned, we're almost like Vigaria, but we can't eat for this. So let's eat or be eaten. So this is a demo of what we want. Again, like a normal Vigaria, if we go over a player and we're bigger in size, and in our radius of the player, uh, we're going to be able to absorb the mass. So let's break it down. So 
We're going to follow this step by step. First, we're going to implement the player attempt a player helper function, which is an analog to our player attempt a food helper function. Um, and this is this function is basically going to check if a given player one can eat a given player two. And if this if these checks are met, then it stores player two in an array called players game. So let's go and do that. So Nick is going to start coding the step 5.1. I'm going to copy paste some stuff. Alright, so a lot of this, as you might see, if you look up, um, a lot of this is similar to the player attempt to eat food function because essentially eating mechanisms are basically the same in our game. So Instead of getting the food, now we're going to get the position of player two. So we get player one's position, player two positions, um, and bring them out in x1, x2, and y1, y2. And now we're going to use the classic distance formula to get the distance between the two players given their coordinates. And you can you guys can actually check out the next step and follow along in the code as Nick does it. Um, it'll just save some time and also allow you to you know follow along without having to type. So I would actually suggest checking out um, step five and uh, looking through the code as many types of it. So now that we have the distance, let's check, let's add some checks. So we're gonna check to see if player one is, uh, if the distance is less than um, player one's radius times, or times, times this, uh, Edible range ratio that we defined from before, which you know you guys can play around with parameters and test out. And another check that we want to do is check that um, the player one's radius times our predefined edible size edible size ratio is greater than um, the radius of the player two. So essentially the first check is checking to see if we're in range, and the second check is checking to see if we're big enough. And finally, if these two checks are met, we're going to um, we're gonna add player two's radius to player one's radius, which is just absorbing their mass essentially. And we're gonna push or add the player two um, reference to our player's eaten array. All right, so let's move on to the next step. So 5.2 isn't too much that we're going to do. Um, essentially, we defined our helper function, which does all the work. So now there's this new function called compute players eat players, which, like before, is going to check all the pairwise possible eatings between two players. So we're going to check to see if a player can eat another player, basically a double four. So it's just one line of implementing. Uh, we have our double for loop, and we're going to call the helper function on each of the players. Any questions before we move on? Cool, so let's move on to step 
And if you recall, our helper function, player attempt eat player, it stored all the players we wanted to eat in this array players eating. So now let's just call a remove player on each of the players in this array that we to store. So it's called remove player on a priority. And then finally in this step, let's update the game loop. Um, the game loop that runs 60 times per second. And uh, let's update it with the functions that we've defined so that we can actually check to see if any players are meeting every tick. So all we have to add is compute players and players to our game. All right, so let's demo quickly of what we've created. Internet edge. Yeah, so you can see Nick is kind of like opening two different browsers and uh, testing it by himself. This is something that you might frequently want to do on your own um, to test if your sockets work by simply just opening another tab in an incognito browser or a different browser entirely. Um, so Nick is able to eat foods and now be eat. Let me get bigger first. <laughs> Look at that. So now we're winning. All right, so let's move on to the next step. So can everyone run if you didn't already hit reset dash dash hard and get check out w10 dash step five. And sort of look through the code and see if there's any questions you have, add them to the questions doc. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm going to ask everyone to run git reset dash dash hard and git checkout w10 dash step six. So can we, or w, or w10 uh, dash complete. Um, all right, so let's go back to step six. In this step, we're just going to add some utility to our game. Now that our game is functional, we want to be able to respawn and win, right? We want to make the game replayable. So we briefly touched this upon this earlier, that we have two ways to communicate with the, um, between the client and the server. And if there's anything you take away from this lecture, this should be one of the most important things, right? In W8 and before, we used API endpoints to communicate between clients and servers. In W9, we introduced something called sockets. And now we have these two tools to communicate between the clients and the server. And these are API endpoints, or APIs, and sockets. In this case, in our game, we use sockets for game updates because they need to be fast. And this is just basically sending any update from the client to the server, from the server to the client, at a very fast rate, right? 60 frames per second. But for some slower things and things that don't really need to be sent fast, we should use API endpoints because we can choose specifically when to send them, and we can um, be more careful when sending them, essentially. Um, and in our game, we're going to use API endpoints to spawn in players and despawn players. So when we're implementing the spawn button, we're going to have the actual spawn button render on the game page. So we're going to click the button in the game page. We're going to send an API request to an API endpoint called slash spawn, 
We're going to send that data through the server socket and then into the game logic file. And the game logic file is where we're going to spawn in the player actions. So let's walk through the five sub steps of step six. Um, so step 6.1. Um, in step one, we or step two, we implemented um, basically a player spawning in as soon as they connected or as soon as they logged into the website. So let's remove that and make functions instead. So let's go to a server socket and um, sort of see how we do that. So Nick is going to implement two lines of code. So in this function, um, we're going to remove the call to spawn player first from the add user function. And remember, add user is just when the user log in, logs in to Catbook. And we're going to define separate functions, add user to game, which is going to um, spawn the player. And also, we're going to fill in remove user from game. Um, which is going to remove the user using our function removal. All right, let's move on to step 6.2. In this step, we're going to look at the api.js file, and we're going to add endpoints to each of these functions that we want to, uh, we want to call. So let's go to api.js. So we're going to define two endpoints. We're first going to define the spawn endpoint. So if you can recall, the way we define endpoints is router.get um, or post. In this case, our client is actually going to call this endpoint, right? And the client is not receive, is not expecting to receive any data because we're pressing the spawn button. We're actually giving data from the client to the server. So it's good practice to use a post request in this case. So let's do router.post slash spawn. And then essentially just call um, add user to game from a service socket file, add the user to the game, and then send back nothing, essentially. And then let's also define the despawn endpoint, which is just the same thing except we remove the player from the game. Any questions? Okay. So let's move on to the next subset, 6.3. Let's add a spawn button to the game page and make it called the API. This is purely front end, so let's go to game.js in our client server or in our client folder. And then let's define um, the function that we want to call when pressing on click. So remember, on click takes it back, takes in a callback function that it calls when um, we press a button. So in this case, our callback function is going to have the functionality of sending a post request, and this post request is going to spawn in. And remember that we sent in the user ID to our post request, so make sure to include that object when we're sending the request. Okay, now that we have the functionality to press the button and send the API, um, or send the data through the API endpoint, let's move on to the next subset. Let's make sure to clean up. So in game.js, we scroll up um, to line 24. We actually have to call despawn when we leave the page. Recall that the return statement in the use effect is going to be called when unmounting the component, essentially when the, when the user on the website leaves the game page. So when we leave the game page, we want to call the despawn endpoint. And then another place we have to Clean up is in service side. So let's go there. So in line 57, 
we just remove the play, remove the user from the game when the user disconnects from, or when the user logs out from the website. And Nick, in a few moments, is just going to talk about the importance of cleaning up. Um, one last step we want to do before we wrap up is add winning, right? We want to be able to win and not like keep growing in size. So let's check win on the server. We're going to define a function called check win. So we've defined this function for you. Um, you can look through it on your own later. And in our game loop, we're just going to call the check win function to um, essentially just check whatever. Um, like every tick we want to check if the player has won the game. And then in our game page, we want to sort of include this helpful pop-up when the winner wins the game. So let's add a state called winner modal. And this winner modal is going to be this HTML element. Um, we can actually store HTML elements in the state. And whenever this HTML element updates, it's going to re-render the page, right? Whenever state is updated on React, it re-renders the page. So we can just have winner modal as a state, and then in our actual rendering, um, or in our process update, um, we can set the state if we receive an update from the server that the winner is defined. So we can check if update winner is not undefined, or if update winner is not null, um, then we can define the winner modal. If not, we keep the state as null. And one important thing to note is that if we have a null element, the way it appears, if we have a null element and we put it in our rendering, in our React component, it will just render nothing. It won't throw an error. So right now, if we just put winner modal, if it's null, it'll just render nothing. If it's not null, then it'll render our winner modal. And if we test out um, game modes, you'll actually see that we have winning functionality. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to show you guys what winning looks like, but um, okay, we also have the functionality of spawning in, so users don't spawn in automatically. Yeah, just um, a few things to note are this lecture was very chunky, as I mentioned before, and we definitely touched on everything from W1, W0 until W9. And it's okay to not get even half of the content. We said a lot of things, and it's important that you guys just get the general ideas of using sockets and API endpoints um, and the difference between client and server rendering, or rendering on the client and storing game logic on the server. Remember that everything, every game logic has to be stored in the server. Please do not store any game logic in the client. So just keep that in mind. All right, so I'll pass it on to Nick. We can talk about cleanup and then a few additional features we added to game. Game. Yeah, so we did this cleanup stuff in step 6.4. It turns out if you actually don't do that, you will see the game or the demo that we just did run just fine. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of bugs if you don't clean up. Um, for instance, if a client joins the game, they click the spawn button, it follows this path up, your server spawns a new player, which you can see is the circle right here. If you use more clients during the game, now you have a bunch of these different players in the same lobby, now you have a whole bunch of these circles. And then if everyone decides to go get lunch, then now there's still a bunch of circles sitting around um, different players just on the game that are not going to be moving, they're not going to be interacting. They will not move or interact because they have been permanently disconnected, but they'll just be sitting there. And usually you don't want this to happen. So how do we get, how do we fix this? So we pretend we have a client, like let's say Joe, let's say Joe's internet disconnects because it's on my MIT secure and or Joe falls asleep. Um, the server will take the player, which is the circle, and put it in the trash can by using the delete keyword or using various other um, like deletion mechanisms, and then the server will be happy. And the main point is to take away is that in our case, we had to remove the player whenever the socket disconnects, and that is, um, I'll show the example here. 
Yes, here. So in remove user, remove user is actually what it's called when a socket disconnects. And so we added this remove user from game call um, within this thing so that whenever a socket disconnects, it'll just remove them from the game. And then also if the player navigates to a different page, um, that will dismount whatever the game page is. And so we added this thing up here in the game page. Um, so on a dismount or on unmount, it will tell the API to despawn the player. So if you leave the page, you'll go away. Um, and you should consider doing these things in your own projects as well. All right, so yeah, Kenny mentioned that, I mean, this is definitely probably the hardest workshop by far in WebLab just because of the nature of like having so many different moving components. Um, but yeah, feel free if you have any questions, you can come to Office Hours, we have Office Hours tonight, 32082. Um, you can also rewatch the videos or you know, ask us to explain anything on Piazza. Um, you can look through the comments on the code in the different sort of steps. Um, there, it should be pretty well documented for like all kinds of um, information. Uh, what in the world? If you want to see the final product, you can check, get reset dash dash hard and check out W10 uh, complete. If you do do that, you might notice there's a couple extra things that we actually added for you. Um, one of those being sprites, so you can see these like pictures of uh, stuff on the on the actual cells. We also added map bounds and some auto reset, so the server will automatically like reset itself after five seconds um, when someone wins. And there's a little bit of extra styling, so you feel free to check out the code, um, look through what we've made, and there should be some interesting and useful stuff that you might be able to take away and uh, use for your own projects. But yeah, so that is the last workshop of WebLab. So congrats.